Snows like it did today, it's pretty difficult to get into work, and reporter Mike McArdle had the same problem. Now, here's his excuse. Boss, boss, I'd like to have a word with you. You'd like me to come to work today, but there are a few reasons why I haven't been able to make it. Like many other people, I have a walkway to shovel. And let me just show you a few other things that need to be done. But first, we have to check with the retired Mountie neighbor to see if this much snow is really a big deal. Retired Mounties know everything. We've had, we've had as much snow as this before. I don't believe that. I've sure. lived here 10 years. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 64. 64 was a bigger year? I wasn't here in 64, but 75 was a pretty bad year, too. Holy mackerel. Look at that. 17 inches. I don't know what that is in centimeters, but that's a lot of snow. Back to the neighbors, and it looks like there's not going to be any traffic on this street for a while. And there's neighbor Steve and his sons over the back fence, and we have a question for them. Would you go to work on a day like this? I have no idea. Because <laughs> I don't go to work. Well, I wouldn't go to work on a day like this. I can see that. There are other things more important than working today, like feeding the birds. That's a bird feeder I made this morning. That's pretty nifty. Look at it. The birds are not coming to it, but you see... This is my wife's idea to put that up there to keep the snow out and, and then put the seeds in there, but the, the birds are uh, terrified of it. This is a day when things you remember all year long happen, not a day for working. And it is a day when feeding birds is one of the most important jobs anyone can have because when you feed birds, the whole world looks warmer. And who can go to work on such a balmy afternoon? Well, we were at work on a balmy afternoon, but yes. the Canucks weren't. I'd rather be home feeding the birds like <laughs> McArdle <laughs> exactly. was. Yeah. The Canucks were snowed out. The Grizzlies tomorrow night play San Antonio. San Antonio was in Portland tonight, so they've got to get from Portland to here in time Ooh. for the game, so hopefully everything will work out. Wow, okay. Yeah. So it's weather permitting then, the game yes. tomorrow? Yes, we'll know tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, Bernie. Yeah, and we are out of time. Thanks for watching News Hour Final. Be careful on the roads. They are icy. Until tomorrow, good night. When you're 75 and all your friends are burying their husbands, I'll still be fit and virile. You're not fit and virile now. Home Improvement on BCTV, TV for BC. Introducing the incredible new Clean and Fit from Frontel, the first aerobic workout that cleans your floor. Now I've seen it all. We can't keep watching this, though. I'm begging you. Let's get Super Channel, okay? Look at this. Super Channel brings you premium releases fresh from the big screen. 80 uninterrupted movies a month, 24 hours a day. Call our cable company now, please. I'll stop hiding the remote control, I swear. Many obstacles in life seem impossible to overcome. However, through the supernatural powers of a psychic, the mysteries of life can be penetrated. Hi, I'm Bobby, and I'd like to talk to you about the quality of your life. Are you troubled with questions on marriage, health, or family? If so, our staff of psychic advisors can help you with your problems. They have that special ability to find the hidden meanings to the mysteries of life. For your own personal reading, dial 19... But still not great. As for the side roads, well, they're not plowed and won't be for some time. There are only a few snow plows in Victoria, and abandoned vehicles are making their jobs more difficult. And for those traveling by transit in Victoria, there are only three bus routes up and running this hour. The Victoria Airport, meantime, has been reopened after being closed for all of yesterday. Here in Vancouver, the transportation situation is a little better than in Victoria. As we mentioned earlier, buses are running, but there are delays. SkyTrain is also running, albeit sporadically. But for those people who ventured out in their vehicles this morning, it was another West Coast adventure, thanks to Mother Nature. Freezing rain turned city streets into sheets of ice this morning. People using transit faced waits of up to an hour. Over 30 buses were out of operation at the start of the day, and only five of SkyTrain's 33 cars were running. It's really bad out there, actually. 
Once you're on the highway, it's fine. Once you're on the side road, it's fine. That's because much of yesterday's 35 centimeters of snow had yet to be cleared. Everybody wants a Coke, so got to keep working. Where did it come from this morning? Langley. Anybody go for it? Well, I had to pull out quite a few. That was all right. It was kind of slick. As long as people drive halfway sanely. While work crews had yet to make it to this side street, a fleet of 56 city trucks have been plowing and salting around the clock. But this salt truck complicated the morning rush downtown by knocking trolley lines down and forcing the closure of two city blocks. He knocked some uh, wires down, I think, because the uh, box was up and the trolley wires are down and they're blocking traffic in all four directions right now. Uh, How's the walking? Like terrible! <laughs> And that's how boat owners felt this morning. The weight of snow and rain combined caused dozens of boat sheds to collapse at a number of Fraser River marinas. Some of the boats were liveaboards. People woke to the sound of crashing timber on top of their vessels. Uh, it was probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I just heard a big crash. Uh, the boat kind of teeled over, and then it stayed at a heel position, so we went outside, and the, uh, the whole top of the, uh, the shed here had come down on top of the boat. And I've uh, broken the mast off, I've broken our pilot house. Um, we had to, uh, like when the fire department came down, we had to crawl through underneath there and got out with the uh, hovercraft. And then uh, now we're just waiting to see what happens next. I'm just in the boat repair business. So I'm just down here, it's my old territory. So I'm just down checking out some of my friends' boats. But, uh, I've been working on this arm of the river for 30 years and it's the worst it's ever been. There's always been the odd shed go down once in a while, but not like this. The biggest concern now is flooding. City crews are turning their efforts to clearing curb lanes and exposing drains in anticipation of a rapid melt. The worst snowstorm in 30 years could lead to the worst flooding as well. And a plea for patience from BC Tell at this hour. Only half the usual staff made it to work this morning, and that's caused delays in services such as operator and directory assistance and customer service. BC Tell is asking you to avoid phoning those services if possible. Also, severe weather conditions, especially on Vancouver Island, are causing long delays in installation and repair service. Now, if you thought that we set some kind of record for snow, you are absolutely right. Once again, David Jones joins us with the details. Uh, that's right, Jennifer. A couple of records at least fell. At this point, uh, we're still trying to figure it out at the weather office. Uh, finding these numbers sometimes is difficult, but we do know that we set a couple of 24-hour snowfall records for both Vancouver and Victoria, and did we ever shatter them? The old record at Vancouver was about 31 centimeters, and uh, we came in with uh, 41 centimeters in a 24-hour period at Vancouver. Over in Victoria, 64.5 centimeters of snow fell in a 24-hour period. Now, the former record monthly total for snowfall at Victoria, to put this in perspective, Jennifer, mm -hmm. is about uh, 75 centimeters. That's the record total for, for the, the whole month. month. Okay. And we saw 65 in 24 hours in Victoria. Amazing. It is. Amazing. And the worst part, of course, is, is the freezing rain and the rain that's come on top of that. That's weighing everything mm -hmm. down. The uh, lines, uh, hydro lines, the uh, trees are, are all getting very heavy and creating a lot of problems out there. Okay, David, we'll check back with you once again a little later. Right. Thank you. Washington State is also reeling from its recent storms. Conditions are so bad there, Washington Governor Mike Lowry has declared a disaster in 12 western counties and he's activated the National Guard. Highways are shut down all over the state and abandoned cars are scattered on roads as people give up on driving. Power lines are down. More than 130,000 homes and businesses are still without electricity. Trains are also stalled and dozens of flights have been delayed at SeaTac Airport. It's looking much the same even farther south. Heavy rain, snow, and high winds have, pen have been pounding parts of Oregon for the past few days. Highways have been closed and even trains are having trouble. Motorists are being told to stay off the roads unless absolutely necessary. Almost 30,000 people are without power in Portland alone, but conditions are expected to improve soon. Temperatures are warming up, although of course there is now the risk of flooding. Well, B.C. and the Pacific Northwest are not the only places getting some of the worst Mother Nature has to offer. A long spell of frigid winter weather in Europe has claimed dozens of lives. We'll have that story for you later on the new news hour. Also coming up, health news, including what not to do to babies. We're back in a couple of minutes.
presented by Bonus Black. Great Sony stuff or up to... ...dip to record lows of minus 35. More than 80 homeless people have frozen to death and hundreds more are being treated for frostbite. The ice and snow have also caused chaos on roads and highways across the continent. Trains have been canceled and flights from major airports are delayed. And although Italy is suffering from under unusually harsh waves of cold and snow, it's not yet known if the weather is responsible for a fatal train crash this morning. Four people were killed and at least 15 others injured when two passenger trains collided northeast of Milan. Officials say the commuter trains were running on the same track when they crashed head-on. It's not known yet why the trains were on the same track or whether those who died were passengers or crew members. And a powerful bomb has torn through an exp express train in India, killing at least 40 people. Rescue crews are on the scene and have pulled 18 bodies from the wreckage so far. The explosion ripped apart three cars of the New Delhi-bound train and derailed many others. 1,200 people were aboard, most of them believed to be vacationers heading to New Delhi to celebrate New Year's Eve. It's believed Bodo tribal guerrillas fighting for a separate homeland used a remote control device to detonate the bomb. And the second day of a massive strike has effectively shut down all public services in Israel. Hundreds of thousands of people have walked off the job, shutting down utility companies, postal service, media broadcasts, banks, seaports, and public transportation. Hospitals are operating on a Sabbath schedule. The workers are protesting the free market policies of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who also plans on slashing spending and increasing taxes. In an unprecedented gesture of conciliation, South Korea has returned the remains of 24 North Koreans killed in the South in September. The submarine crew was shot by South Korean troops after coming ashore. But after North Korea expressed deep regret for the incident yesterday, South Korea agreed to send the bodies home. One by one, members of the United Nations Honor Guard carried the remains of the 24 infiltrators to the dividing line between the two Koreas and delivered them to North Korean troops. The handover came barely 24 hours after North Korea issued a low-key apology for the failed intrusion last September when a North Korean spy sub was washed up on a South Korean beach. That incident froze the limited relations between the two Koreas and between the U.S. and the North. But North Korea apparently was forced to make its grudging apology in order to get badly needed food aid and to restart the stalled talks on replacing its plutonium-producing nuclear power plants. American diplomats brokered the North's apology. President Clinton welcomed the expression of regret, saying, I am pleased that Pyongyang has pledged to prevent the recurrence of such an incident and has expressed its willingness to work with others for durable peace and stability on the peninsula. South Korea, which launched a massive manhunt to catch the infiltrators, was less enthusiastic. South Koreans remain suspicious that the North is trying to drive a wedge between themselves and the Americans. The South had cut off donations of food to the North, which desperately needs them, because two years of devastating floods have destroyed crops and farmland. But South Korean officials are saying that the North's apology should help defuse tensions on the Korean Peninsula. We'll take a break now and be back with health news in just a couple of minutes, including details of a new procedure to test the health of your bones for early detection of osteoporosis. Stay with us. components, exquisitely crafted in British Columbia. The fine-grained Sitka spruce provided by Macmillan Hotel, making the most of a renewable resource. Natural ability can only take you so far. Equipment counts for a lot. I'm always checking out new ideas. You have to to stay competitive. That's what I like about Pert Plus. Cleans and conditions in one step. No messing with two bottles. I get great results. No hassle, no fuss. Eventually, we all cross the finish. The winners just find a better way to get there. Perk Plus, great hair, no fun. Another town, another show. Wake up on the bus, but that's life on the road. Though the morning is bright, it's 
still feels like last night. Found a grown folk just to prove that a wrong pulls me through. So wherever I roam, it always brings me home. The best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. We're traveling BC with BC Hydro, taking a look at how Hydro is planning today to provide power for tomorrow. Here at Seven Mile, we're making improvements to provide more efficiency and more capacity. In the next four years, a fourth generating unit will add 25% more capacity for peak demand periods. That means the power will always be there when you need it. Resource smart projects mean we get more out of existing facilities and you get power for the future. BC Hydro, reliable services, resourceful people. Every year, the favorite at the church bake sale are Rosalind Wilson's Rice Krispie Squares. The pennies they earn help keep the church in good repair. This year, Rosalind has moved to a new parish. What better time for the introduction of Kellogg's ready-made Rice Krispie Squares? Kellogg's Rice Krispie Squares, now ready-made with the original recipe for the taste you know and love. They were from two different worlds. Why people lie. I don't lie. Born to be enemies. You know nothing about hate. Sit down. But sworn to be friends. He will kill you. No! Keeping the promise. Drama for BC, Thursday. This segment is brought to you in part by TD Bank. We're here to help make it easier. Word of another Cabbage Patch attack has surfaced, this time in San Diego. The Snack Time Kid doll is supposed to munch on plastic snacks like pretzels and celery. Instead, she consumes just about anything that can fit in her mouth, like little girl's hair. Susan Schurer of CBS News has the story. On the floor. Yeah. This is what's left of four-year-old Emmy Sivage's favorite Christmas present. This was the only thing that she asked for Christmas, was the Cabbage Patch Snack Time Kid. Done. She wanted it. The Mattel doll comes with plastic snacks, like a french fry and celery. Normally, the food goes right into the doll's backpack, but this doll took a bite out of little Emmy. What did the doll do to your hair? Ate it. The piece of hair got into the doll's mouth and it start, started going up. It sounds funny at first, but her sister Macy and parents Gail and Scott Sivage weren't laughing. The face was so tight against the top of her head, pushed down like this, there was no way I could cut the hair. If you pulled on the doll, it only grabbed more, and it was pulling her hair away from her scalp. Where was it on your hair? Right here. Did it hurt? Mm-hmm. It was tight. At one point, Gail thought about calling 911. Scott was trying to take the doll apart as fast as he could. Which took about 15 or 20 minutes and 20 screws and a, and a real sharp knife to cut the head back. The problem is the doll doesn't have an on and off switch. She runs on batteries and they come way deep down inside of her body. Once you get this out, you have to deal with the screw that keeps this lid on tight. This isn't the first snack attack by this doll. It took 30 minutes for an Indiana hairdresser to get the doll off of Sarah Stevens' head last week. Mattel says they've had fewer than 10 reported incidents, not counting Emmys. Why'd she eat your hair? I don't know. Cause she, she, wanted to, she wanted to eat it because she was hungry for hair. Emmy feels a little bit cheated by Santa Claus, and she has an after Christmas request. You, what do you want? A cabbage patch that doesn't eat. Maybe an elf at the Mattel factory can take care of this one. Well, head trauma is the leading cause of death and dis Incredible, Jennifer. Amazing. Unbelievable. And yeah. you know, uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the rainfall amounts that I'm seeing in the next uh, couple of days from our numerical model. So I think everyone can help out a little bit by trying to unplug uh, some of the drains on their mm -hmm. streets. That is really going to help because there's a lot of rain in the forecast for the next couple of days. The mild air is moving in. We're still dealing with this system moving through the southern interior. It's snowing all through this area. And I just looked at Comox. They had 12 centimeters of snow in one hour from that system. Here's the radar. You can see that band moving through 
this morning producing lots of rain and snow. It's uh, snowing again up towards Whistler. We've still got some showers across Vancouver Island moving in from the west, although around Victoria, it's not a bad day right now. There's a little bit of a break happening there. You can see it in the clouds here. Here's the main system that's moving through, and uh, we're going to skip right past that. But uh, on the satellite pictures, there is a lot of moisture coming in from the Pacific, and it looks like it's going to be one storm after another. Now, part of our problem is all this cold Arctic air sitting still in the southern interior. I had some reports of freezing rain towards Cranbrook, and it is snowing all through the southern interior, and it's going to get worse as all these systems from the Pacific move up over, over top of that uh, Arctic moisture. Interesting temperatures, plus 5 down towards White Rock, and at the airport is 3 degrees on the east side of the island between 1 and 4, and look at Hope and out in the Fraser Valley. Agassiz is minus 4, and Hope is minus 10, so we've still got a big problem with snow and freezing rain in the inland valleys of the uh, south coast. The uh, next 30 hours, then, is going to look like this. One system after another coming at us from the southwest. All of these low-pressure systems are going to pack a fair amount of moisture, so there's going to be lots of rain. It might be heavy at times over the next couple of days around the inner south coast, which is not going to help the situation, and we're expecting some significant snowfalls in the southern interior. Our forecast for tomorrow, some snow in the southern interior between minus 13 and minus 14 when you wake up. Still cold and dry with a few clouds around up to the north. And on the north coast, we've got flurries with uh, still some Arctic outflow continuing to feel very, very cold up in there. Again, in the afternoon, snow continuing highs to minus 6 on the coast, rising up to about 5 degrees, so it'll change over to rain. And we've got flurries and minus 3 up on the north coast. So around Vancouver then for tonight, we've got another system coming towards us. It looks like it'll be more in the way of rain. And uh, there's still a risk of freezing rain in some areas close to Vancouver. We expect a low down to about 1, but I don't think the temperature is going to budge too much. Tomorrow, periods of rain. On Wednesday, periods of rain. On Thursday, periods of rain. And cooling off somewhat, it could be showers or flurries on Friday. If you need to know more, you can call the weather office. Uh, we're very busy right now. 1-900-565-5555. We'll do all we can to help you out in this very awful weather situation, Jennifer. So I think flooding is going to be the big problem over the next couple of days. With all that snow on the ground, it's not very pleasant. <laughs> oh, I know you've been working around the clock, David. Thank you for that. You're welcome. We'll check back with you a little later. Still to come on today's new news hour, ringing in the new year with a new calendar. And it appears anything goes for 1997. A bit worried driving down Harrison Avenue. At times, we're not sure how deep the water runs. At other times, the scenes are surreal. Burgerville, USA could change its name tonight to Burger Island, USA. And the signs on the road look like they're covered with a liquid form of jello. The lights are on, but about 30 businesses are out of business. Meanwhile, dozens of residents are out of their homes. In the nearby town of Chehalis, much of the Chehalis Avenue apartments are covered with water up to the thigh. This is supposed to be the children's jungle gym and swing set. But if kids were playing tonight, parents would be more concerned about them drowning than falling off. Most tenants here evacuated. They were among the 40 people staying at a church, which the Red Cross turned into a shelter. Peggy Greer's family says they took what valuables they could with them, but they're still worried and feeling run down. He's getting sick because of it. He's getting a cold. And it's getting really hard. The Cruz family is one of the few that did not leave the apartments. They say the water did not come close enough to them. But this is still one flood too many. Well, we lost a lot of things last time. We won't lose all our things this time. When are you moving? As soon as we find a house. My mom's looking for one right now. Now, the Cruz family, of course, taking their chances staying at home, but dozens of others staying at shelters and countless more with friends and relatives. As for Harrison Avenue, police are going to keep this shut down. They're also going to keep I-5, the access to I-5, shut down at least into the morning. They hope by then the river will continue to recede and they'll, they'll be able to reopen it. Dan Amargo? Hopefully it'll get better soon. Farland, thanks. There are flooding problems in the Marysville area tonight. Water is rising in the Eagle Point Mobile Home Park near the Arlington Airport. The water is already about two feet deep there. Water is also over a lot of main roads in that area. Some are closed. People are being advised to leave their homes tonight, but so far the evacuations are strictly voluntary. And this morning it was a very scary situation in North Marysville. A car drove into a major washout on Northeast 144th. One woman inside was not seriously hurt. She was treated and released from a hospital in Everett. And with all we've been through, it looks like it's not all over yet. Steve Poole is back tonight from New York after filling in on Good Morning America. And Steve, we understand there's a new threat tonight. 
Yeah, there are some new concerns that we'll talk about. First of all, I must tell you that watching all this from back there, it unfolded, it was almost surreal, unbelievable, as I see neighborhoods and streets that I know so well just buried in all of this. But let's talk about what might be next on the agenda here. We've managed to pull through one system here. There's a bit of a gap, but there's more activity developing out there. What does activity mean? Let's try to spell it out for you. First of all, there's some lower pressure that's just uh, off the coast here. That's going to start to track up off the Olympic Peninsula by tomorrow and tomorrow afternoon. With that, we get two elements. We get more rainfall, and that's going to help to continue to melt the snow, still put some pressure on the rivers, but what we're also watching is the development of some strong winds, and there are some high wind watches up. We'll detail those areas for you a little bit later in the show, but things are not quite over yet. We have a new concern, and that's the wind. And it's probably not going to be all that bad, but given what we've been through, it bears watching. I'll be back a little bit later on, Dan and Margo, give you the rest of the forecast, tell you about the mountain passes, too, and try to keep us working our way out of all this. You have our attention again, and uh, welcome back. Steve. Thank you. Thanks. Tonight, it's clear there's plenty of cleanup left to do. Como's Lynn Espinosa joins us from an east side store where the repair work hasn't even started. No, since we were here 24 hours ago, the only thing Crossroads Mall has done is put up this barricade to make absolutely sure that no one gets very close to the Blockbuster Music Store, which was totally devastated. The problem for businesses like this is that structural engineers have to shore up the building before owners can even figure out how much they've lost, and here you can see it's a lot. We took a tour around western Washington, and you'll see plenty of people have lost plenty. As the roof comes up at the Edmonds Marina, it reveals an ugly truth. Hundreds of broken or sunken treasures. Boats worth millions of dollars combined. About 50 miles to the south, a business district scrambles to save itself. Not from the storm, but from its watery aftermath. North, a Bellingham auto service store demolished. Cars brought here to be fixed, need now to be fixed more. The scramble is on to make things right. I told the boss, hey, get people back to work by seniority and need. I can take time off, I can collect unemployment. For the first time we see inside Totem Lake Mall, a collapsed roof above one store will have a lasting impact on others. Structural damage, water damage. Total damage at an Everett furniture store. It started with a hole in the roof. Then the walls caved in. We may be done with walking in the slough and snow for a while, but it'll be weeks before it's clear how much has been lost. So many of the boat owners, car owners, business owners are insured. That's what makes situations like this for Blockbuster mu Music so frustrating, because until they get this building shored up, they can't get that insurance money. And of course, that is crucial to them right now. Well, that's quite a sight right there. Some of the other amazing video we saw is those marina roofs collapsing on boats. Whose insurance covers what in all this? We've seen an awful lot of them. And unless the boat owner can show that the marina owner was negligent in building their roof, that somehow it was structurally insufficient, the boat owner pays for the boat, the marina owner pays for any marina damage. Thank you, Lynn. Some people in Mukilteo aren't just cleaning up, they are still digging out. Three huge mudslides hit several homes underneath a bluff. In each, each case, a chunk of the hillside broke loose, smashing into homes below. An elderly woman was trapped behind one slide and firefighters had to rescue her. They put her on a gurney to carry her across the mud. How are you feeling? Oh, fine. <laughs> it sounded like a round from an 8-inch gun landing. It sounded like an artillery projectile. We're worried about our house. Yeah, we leaving. We built it only three years Ten ago. Four. And we're worried about the whole hill. Hey, go ahead. Which vehicle? Tonight, some families are refusing to leave their homes despite the threat of more mudslides. So far, though, no one has been hurt. Another big slide near Aberdeen could take three days to clean up. Tons of rock and mud are covering Highway 12, which is the main road into Aberdeen. A detour has been set up for now. That's not the only problem in Grays Harbor County. The Chehalis River is out of its banks tonight, spilling over onto farmland and roads and threatening some homes. 20,000 sandbags have been sent to the county to for homeowners to help repair them.
The storm is making for headaches in other parts of western Washington. In Bremerton, the roof of the Olympic Community College Library fell in. Today, librarians and workers tried to save whatever escaped damage. Many valuable books were not damaged, but the college's TV studio is a mess, and water is dripping just about everywhere. A Pierce County Transit bus toppled over on Interstate 5 today. It was headed from Seattle to Tacoma. No passengers were on board. The driver is okay. And a bit of good news for North End commuters. The state tells us the Interstate 5 express lanes should be reopened for tomorrow's commute. Well, nothing gives you an idea about how widespread all this storm damage really is, like a look from the air. Therefore, I captured the scenes from all around our area earlier today. We've been showing you the collapsing boat shelters at the Edmonds Marina. Here's how widespread the damage is. 17, all but two of the shelters collapsed. Nearly 300 boats sank. The damage here will run into the millions. In Federal Way, people are evacuated from their homes in one subdivision. On their way out, they cruised by boat past their neighbors' trucks and cars. Two rivers are out of their banks south of Puget Sound. Near Centralia, the Chehalis and the Skookumchuck are flooding farmland. A shelter has been set up in Chehalis for families forced to leave their homes. Millions of gallons of water from melted snow and rain are pouring over Snoqualmie Falls. It makes for quite an impressive sight. Here's more information on this week of rough weather we have just had. The deaths of seven people are now blamed on the storms in our state, mostly from traffic accidents and falling branches. We're getting our first damage estimates ranging from $125 to $250 million in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. And 15 counties are now under a state of emergency. King, Snohomish, Skagit, Whatcom, Island, San Juan, Clallam, Mason, Kitsap, Thurston, Pierce, Cowlitz, and three new counties, Grays Harbor, Lewis, and Jefferson. Como News 4 will bring you continuing coverage as we face new storm threats. Steve Poole is back with a full forecast around 1118, and we'll have the latest on what to expect for your New Year's Eve tomorrow on Como News 4 at 5 and 6 a.m. Plenty of trouble down along the Columbia River, too. All the rain and melting snow isn't helping the situation along the Washington-Oregon border. Just take a look at these pictures of the Columbia near the Bonneville Dam. The water level's high and likely to rise even higher with more rain forecast to the south. The river looks like it's starting to flow over its banks in some places. Interstate 84, the main highway along the river on the Oregon side, is closed because of slides between Troutdale and Hood River. The trouble stretches all the way into Idaho tonight. A six-foot snowdrift smashed through the roof of the auditorium at the Sandpoint High School. There's a 30 by 40 foot hole in the roof. This is what it looks like from the inside. Luckily, no one was inside at the time, though a band practice in the gym had just been canceled. Problems, too, tonight in California, especially for a family in Pacifica near San Francisco. Their house is perched on the edge of an unstable bluff. The house was condemned last week after its deck collapsed under the weight of rain. So the Red Cross is helping out the family who hopes something can be done to save what's left. In the wine country, people are filling sandbags. The Napa River is expected to hit flood stage sometime tonight, followed by the Russian River tomorrow. Three local hikers are missing. A search for them will resume first thing in the morning. Or on the know. weather that we're kind of shell-shocked. Yeah, I know. And, and folks, we should point out, that, and I'm going to tell tell everybody, can we go back to this shot here? We're going to tell everybody what we did here. Well, I'll tell you in just a sec. What, what uh, Dan did before I left is he said, hey, Steve, maybe when you go, we're going to have like a big snowstorm with really cold weather and everything. It'll be just <laughs> awful, you know? And you said you, you didn't really <laughs> see it. And I was, you left a few days before yeah, this right. happened. And I said, oh, no, it's going to happen. Yeah. We're going to get blasted. Yeah, and I said, oh, Dan, come on. And Steve, said, guess I, what? <laughs> you know, I haven't told anybody this Well, I'm going to tell everybody. To, yeah, yeah right. you know, it's one of those things. And I must admit to a great deal of frustration uh, sitting back there watching all this unfold and, and not being able to be here to help uh, get us through it. But let's uh, pick up where I left off. All right? Okay. What's going on outside right now? We have cloudy skies and just a little bit of rain around, 46 degrees, south wind at 12. Uh, 2930 with the barometer falling, and we've got a, just a four tenths of an inch of rain in the rain gauge, continuing to melt all of that snow. It's just uh, in incredible to look at. 50 for the high today, 39 the low, above normal for our temperature, so that continues that process. You can see on the radar here, we still have some rain around, a lot of it to the north, some moving in from the south. As we continue throughout the evening, it will be kind of rain on again, off again. 
And as we get into tomorrow, that will continue even more so, and we'll add the element of some wind as well. But that's our story for tonight, just pretty much rain showers for most folks, continuing to melt the snow. Overnight low temperatures will be in the upper 30s to the low 40s, so everyone stays above freezing tonight. None of the uh, worries about freezing roadways or anything like that. Obviously still a lot of slush around, so be careful if you're out and about. This is what it looks like on a satellite image here, and we cast our eyes out to the next system, which is right about here. What's going to happen with that is as it comes on in here, it will continue to move up to the north of us just slightly. And when you have that kind of pattern, what it tends to do is it tends to increase the chance that you're going to get stronger winds along with the rain. So that's our story. Wind on the coast especially, but everyone will get a little breezy here. 50 in Olympia, 52 in Chehalis, 49 in Longview for tomorrow. And over on the coast, there's already a high wind watch in effect which means it's not happening yet, but we have to pay attention. A warning means it's just about to happen or fairly imminent. Uh, 51 in Hoquiam, 54 in Long Beach, and 49 in Forks. Now, central Puget Sound Basin, high temperatures will actually be pretty mild. We're talking upper 40s and into the low 50s, and then later on in the afternoon, that wind starts to become more and more of a factor. We have to watch. Obviously, there's a real moist ground here, so the possibility of some trees down with the wind also exists. Uh, 48 in Port Angeles tomorrow. We give you 45 in Victoria and 47 in Oak Harbor. Let's jump east of the mountains and travel through the mountain passes. Uh, I checked each one of them. The, the majors all temporarily closed and, and will be until further notice. We'll let you know when that begins to change. And east of the Cascades, the moisture arrives over there. It's primarily in the form of rain, although some freezing rain, and as you can see, the temperatures remain cold, 26 in Omac, 30 in Moses Lake tomorrow, 47 in the Tri-Cities. We've got rain at times tonight, then 40 to 45 degrees by tomorrow. Showers and kind of breezy, 35 to 40. That's your, your morning. And then in the afternoon, it looks like we'll just continue to increase the rain and the wind with temperatures upper 40s and into the low 50s. Rainy, windy, and on the mild side, near 50 then, let's call it that, we'll give you 51 on Wednesday, Thursday's high 44 degrees, and then Friday we cool off a bit, high of 41, low of 34 degrees. Nothing huge out there after that, that that I can see at this point. So also I want to say just a, a special note to, to Todd Johnson, uh, who did just incredible work while I was away. I know that he, and of course Tom McCarthy, had to shoulder a huge load, and I, I'm feeling a little guilty about that, guys, mm -hmm. but tre tremendous job. Sure, they put they in did. a lot of hours. They really did. Kudos to them. They're home getting some sleep right now. Yes. You're back. <laughs> the government has made its decision on what many are calling a dangerous doll. Still ahead on Como News 4, its official response to complaints, this doll threatens the safety of children. <laughs> And check out this new idea for smashing stress. Start the year off right at Circuit City's New Year's Sale. You'll save on the best names in audio, video, computers, appliances. From Creston to Yak. Uh, however, as is the case in all roads in southern BC tonight, there are extremely slippery sections due to the freezing rain. Government workers in the Fraser Valley and, in, and Victoria are being asked to take another day off. The Provincial Emergency Program is recommending that government workers stay home to reduce traffic so that roads can be available for clearing and emergency use. Most government offices were closed today in Victoria, Vancouver, and the Fraser Valley. And since Wednesday is a public holiday, government workers won't be back on the job until Thursday. <laughs> Now to some of the damage left by the worst storm to hit B.C. in 75 years. Already the cost is in the millions and counting. Boathouses are not made to hold a lot of wet snow. As luck would have it, at the Captain Cove Marina in Ladner, one side of the flat-roofed sheds withstood the weight, the other did not, resulting in several million dollars in damaged yachts. But it could have been far worse for those living on board their boats. It was probably about 2 o'clock in the morning and I uh, just heard a big crash. Uh, the boat kind of teeled over. And then it stayed at a heel position, so we went outside, and the, uh, the whole top of the, uh, the shed here had come down on top of the boat. And uh, I'd broken the mast off, had broken our pilot house. Um, we had to, uh, like when the fire department came down, we had to crawl through underneath there and got out with the uh, hovercraft. And then uh, now we're just waiting to see what happens next. Most marinas suffered some kind of damage. At the Mosquito Creek Marina in North Vancouver, several sheds collapsed, but the boats were moved out in time. 
and at the Vancouver Marina on River Road in Richmond, under every one of these sunken sheds is a sunken yacht. Worked on this arm of the river for 30 years, and it's the worst it's ever been. The guys are going to come in and try and salvage, said they're not going to be here for another four hours. Been like that all night? All night. Started at 11 and just went bang all the way down. And hit at least as hard were marinas in the Victoria area. It's still far too early to estimate the cost of damage. This roof collapsed just before the North Kamloops strip mall opened this morning, crashing in on a vacant store. The rest of the mall remained closed as a precaution. 12 centimeters of snow on top of a layer of ice is thought to have caused the roof to collapse. And in Burnaby, the carport outside of an apartment building collapsed this afternoon. About 10 cars were damaged, but luckily no one was underneath when the uh, garage came down. And if you have any energy left to lift another shovel of snow, you might consider what's above you as well as what's at your feet. What about your roof? Is it safe? Or should you get up there and clear some of the snow off? We talked to the manager of Vancouver's building inspection branch today. Well, the first thing is don't put yourself at risk. The second thing is if you have a flat roof that's accessible, you can get up and clear the drains. That's the big thing to let the water, you know, get off the roof and get away. Uh, the third thing is if, you're, if you have a flat roof to get up there and basically shovel the snow off the roof. But uh, if it's a pitched roof or difficult getting it to? If it's a pitched roof, then basically I, I would basically leave it alone. Um, there was a suggestion of throwing ropes over it, but then if you pull the rope both ways, you're liable to put yourself at the risk of, of the falling snow. And some of that snow is getting heavy up on the top. Have there been any structural uh, damages that you've heard because of snow and rain? We have not heard of any collapses in the city of Vancouver from any of the buildings. So really it's something to be uh, aware of, but uh, don't put yourself at risk to clear your roof. That's correct. Don't put yourself at risk. Uh, that would be the first, that would be our prime concern is don't put yourself at risk. We'll take a short break and be back with a heartwarming story that unfolded in one of the coldest nights of the year. It happened in BC's Fraser Valley when dozens of motorists found themselves stranded on the road to nowhere. So I pull into this gas station. Classic oversqueeze. What? And while all of the missing have now been accounted for, hundreds of people went nowhere for the longest of time. Lynn Collier reports. From the air, the Fraser Valley looks like a winter wonderland. But when you look closer, evidence of this weekend's harrowing snowstorm litter the roads. High winds and blowing snow stranded hundreds of motorists. Some were stuck in their cars for as long as 17 hours until rescuers could reach them. Then they were led in small groups to nearby farmhouses. Just remember the first woman that came in, she looked like she was just about to, to curl up and I don't know what. She was just, it was so, just had ice on her, on her face and just was, oh, the poor lady, I felt so bad for her, but we got some food into her and... 27-year-old Cheryl Tolzma didn't think she'd be entertaining 89 people over the weekend, but when the storm hit, she opened her heart and her house. We had no idea because when um, the police officer, Doug Wilding, he, when he came to our door, he had said, um, you know, probably around 50 people will be coming. And we thought, okay, let's, we'll just deal with that. And, uh, but they just kept coming and coming and coming. The only way to get to the stranded travelers was by train. Southern BC Railway shuttled them into a point where a bus could pick them up. We didn't know what was going to happen. We thought we might have to spend the night in the bus. And, uh, and then, uh, sort of out of nowhere, this uh, guy pulls up in a tractor um, and uh, turns out uh, his, his name is Carl. And uh, he let us uh, stay at his farmhouse. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I guess we were saved <laughs> at that point. You know, we're great people. I don't know how they did it, but so many people in the basement, and uh, it was great to see them. Although the travelers are crediting the Tolzmas with saving their lives, Cheryl says taking in and feeding 89 people was something anyone would do. I don't consider myself a hero at all, because um, anyone would have done it if, if, you know, you just don't leave people in need. I mean, anyone in the world would open their doors to anybody, and, you know, we're fortunate because, um, you know, they were close, and these people were you know, had a place to go, and in our house, we've got room. I mean, hey, we held 100 people here, so what's, what's, it was no big deal. Now, now I'm not no hero at all. <laughs> 
Freezing rain warnings are still in effect right across the lower third of B.C., while Arctic outflow warnings continue for the lower Fraser Valley and the north and central coasts. A warm Pacific airflow from the southwest is starting to chip away at the Arctic air mass dominating the province. Snowfalls across the southern interior should taper off by the morning, leaving 5 to 10 centimeter accumulations. Widespread snow is in the forecast again, though, on New Year's Day. Expect cloudy periods and high wind chills over most of the north. Central regions will end the year with flurries or light snow. Further south, it'll be sunny, cloudy with some lingering flurries, and the Okanagan Valley could see sunny breaks. And the mild daytime temperatures are expected, especially in the Kootenays, with Cranbrook nearing minus 1, although it's not likely to be better than about minus 10 in the Columbias. The lower mainland is in for very mild and wet New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Snow does, does remain a possibility at higher elevations, though, and in eastern sections of the Fraser Valley. Bernie Pascoe is warming up his vocal cords for Sports Center, which is next. And later on News Hour Final, all three other great voices warmed up tonight at BC Play Stadium. Saturday on Money Talks. If you want to know what's in store in 1997, watch us this week because we've got Dr. Tomorrow, Frank Ogden, we've got Harry Dent. We've when the first slide hit, I could hear it. It was a great big rumble. It was incredible. And uh, then looking outside, out the front door, then I saw the next door neighbor's cabin and, and it was, of course, in the water. Three cabins have been ripped from their foundations, destroying them and what's inside. The little things start adding up. Okay, we'll get it fixed. Oh no. Sometimes devastation can't be measured. It's overpowering. That's why salvaging the little things, the things that matter, can sometimes mean so much. And with that situation still developing, we have a live camera there. We hope to get a live report from that location a little bit later in this newscast. Back here in Seattle, yet more trouble. One West Seattle neighborhood is hoping the rain will stop in time to save their homes. Como's Emily Langley has their story. For some residents here, it started with doors that wouldn't open. For others, it was strange noises in the night. We'd heard some popping through the night, uh, but no sudden movements. Nick Marisich's home has been moved about two inches by the wet, unstable hillside behind it. He and his family will have to evacuate. The road on the hillside above tells the tale. A two-inch crack has developed in the pavement, and it is growing. Seven houses have been evacuated. We need to determine which houses are, are really in danger and which ones we can let people back into. A backhoe was brought in to find the gas main shut off. Fire crews say there is little they can do when the ground is so saturated. This is uh, referred to as Spring Hill. And, uh, and there's a number of areas here that uh, uh, have shown a good uh, amount of water coming out of it. Neighbors who've been fighting construction of more houses on the hill above say today's events should send a message to the city. Clearly what has happened today proves that this hill is unstable and there should be no more uh, development in this area. City officials insist the proposed development wouldn't have any impact on the slide area. We don't know but the city's assurances are little comfort for residents here who are just hoping this hillside will dry out without sending homes or mud sliding down the hill. Emily Langley, Como News 4, West Seattle. Right now, three houses remain evacuated in that area of West Seattle. Let's check in now with Steve Poole, who's back with us tonight. And Steve, as we welcome you back, we just look at storm after storm. We're hoping that maybe you have some good news for us. Well, I'm hoping the new year will bring something in the way of new weather to help us get out of all this. But in the meantime, as we wrap up the year, we bring in yet one more storm. And here's what it looks like as it moves ever closer to the coast. You saw the live pictures from Long Beach and over uh, near Hoquiam there just a little bit ago. This is all being caused by some fairly strong low pressure that's going to track just to the north over Vancouver Island. Now that's going to kick off some very strong winds. They're already happening along the coast and also inland you will feel this a little bit. But let me be more specific about where you will get what. If you're along the coast, boy, 50 to 80 miles per hour tonight, the northwest interior 40 to 70 and there are high wind warnings up as a result. Central Puget Sound Basin 15 to 35, which means if you're going out tonight you should be prepared for rain and wind, although not as strong as on the coast and elsewhere, you will definitely feel it. So let's talk about what's next for you. First of all, it's already strong on the coast, but the winds will move inland overnight. The second thing we look at is the heavy rain. That will continue until tomorrow evening and then just start to taper off. Not steady, 
on and off, but heavy at times. And then the drying trend finally gets underway by Friday. Now, Dan, a little bit later on, we're going to come back. We'll talk about the mountain passes, talk about the rivers. Within the last 10 minutes, we've had some flood warnings put up as well. So there's some more to do, and we'll do that for you in a few minutes. Yeah, that drying trend can't come soon enough. Thanks, yeah, Steve. Right. Well, since the winds will hit the coast first and could be the strongest there, we've sent Como's Keith Eldridge to ocean shores. Keith, what's it like there right now? Well, did uh, Steve talk about a drying trend? We haven't seen it here. Folks along the coast are ringing in the new year, ringing wet. We've already had two and a half inches of rain just since noon. That's about a, an inch of rain, what, every two hours? So a half inch every hour. That's really building up around here. And so are the winds. The high winds predicted for later this evening have already arrived here. Uh, at this point, the winds we've clocked are just over 30 miles an hour. And it's starting now to really come in strong. So if you take a look at the coastline, the ocean, real beautiful today as waves come crashing in from the Pacific coast. The Pacific Ocean uh, really having a fury uh, as these winds really pick up. Maybe even some of the waterfowl that normally are used to this weather really don't like today. It's really getting miserable out here. As you look around the, the town of Ocean Shores, everything's buttoned down fairly well. The folks here are used to high winds and uh, heavy rains, but uh, to talk to the, the Ocean Shores police, and they said they've not seen this much water this quick, and, and mixed with the high winds is really going to cause problems. Also causing problems in Grays Harbor County with their mudslide. Now, this mudslide occurred on Sunday afternoon after all that snow melted and caused real uh, problems with all the, the mud and debris coming down the hillside on Highway 12. Uh, that's just outside the town of Aberdeen. It's the main road coming in from Olympia to the town of Aberdeen. It's been closed. All four lanes blocked off. About 1 o'clock this afternoon, they managed to dig a hole, one lane for emergency traffic only. So if there's a life-threatening situation, they can get at least an ambulance through there. But it may be Thursday or even Friday before they can open up that main road. There is a detour around, so the folks aren't limited at this point to getting in and out of Aberdeen. Though the detour is a concern right now because of high water along the Chehalis River. The high tide expected about 10 o'clock tonight here on the Pacific Ocean, and that's when the real concern for the high water, uh, for the Chalis River, the Satsup River, uh, and also the folks who are along the coast with the high winds still coming in about 8 o'clock tonight. It's going to be a uh, long and eventful New Year's Eve for the folks here on the Pacific Ocean, Dan Margo. Yeah, it looks like those gusts are picking up. We'll check back with you, Keith, in just a little bit. Well, we've seen so many pictures over the last mm. several days. The pictures themselves speak volumes. Just looking at Keith and his hood blowing sure. in the wind, you can tell what's happening out there and what might be headed our way. Now here's the latest on the mountain passes closed by our stormy weather. Some good news here. One pass has reopened tonight, and that is White Pass on Highway 12. Temperatures rose above freezing, and that's brought on passable conditions. But Stevens Pass and Snoqualmie Pass are still closed, which has meant no end to frustration for people trying to cross the Cascades. Another avalanche on Snoqualmie means the pass could be closed another three days. It's been tough for those already waiting days to cross. Como's April Zapata joins us right now along I-90 and explains why. April, what's happening up there now? Well, people are just waiting and waiting, and it's especially hard for those on the other side. Case in point, Yakima hasn't received any mail from Seattle because the trucks can't cross. All the traffic that you see here, which is not a lot, is coming from basically North Bend, nowhere near or nowhere east from that and this is normally a very busy on-ramp and now with caution I can practically walk down the middle of it. Things have not been so quiet up near the summit where many truckers have been waiting for days. The boredom is written all over their faces. Truckers have been trapped at the Edgewick truck stop since Noqualmie Pass closed three days ago and they are desperate for other ways to get to the east side of the mountains. But we can go up 97 otherwise. <laughs> now it's just getting out of Washington or getting to the other side of the mountain. As temperatures warm in the mountains, avalanches continue to keep I-90 closed. Now truckers are hearing they may need to wait until Friday to cross Noqualmie Pass. Because we don't get paid if we sit. You know, we get paid by the mile. So sitting, we don't make any money makes everybody upset and tense and I just turn on all my classical music and play with my dog. Hey Mutsy, sit, sit, sit. Yes, dogs, even cats are stuck here too. But that is only half of the problem. For every driver stuck on this side of the pass, there is someone on the other side waiting for their load. So essential supplies like lumber, food, fuel, it's all stuck here in Edgewick 
instead of the places where they're really needed. In Yakima, grocery stores are running out of food and shelves are starting to look bare. Can't get to the uh, uh, little stores up there. I can't do anybody. Matt Cinelli wishes he could deliver his goods to those stuck on the mountain summit, but instead... It's just wasted. And for this truck driver who has hay to deliver to 1,200 waiting cattle, this is the second time he's been stuck here for a grand total of six days. Yes, I've been stuck here before, uh, but not nearly as long as this time. This is the longest I've ever been stuck here. So is there any end in sight? Well, that all depends on the weather. And as we've known for the last few days, Mother Nature has not been very cooperative lately. Reporting on I-90, April Zaveda, Como News 4. Well, and, and April, you know, as frustrating as that has to be, those people seem to be in pretty good spirits, generally. They are generally in good spirits, but some people that we talked to who did not want to go on camera were definitely in very angry moods. And there had to be some of those, too. <laughs> Thanks, April. Well, you don't have to be stuck on either side of the mountain passes to feel cut off. Just ask some of the folks in the San Juan Islands. This is Orcas Island, where snow and ice still cover many roads. Some stores are closed. Many people have no water. The airport is also closed on Orcas Island. And it's not over yet because the forecast for the San Juans is just like ours. Heavy rain and high winds tonight. Ever since our all-day storm coverage on Sunday, a lot of people have called and emailed us asking if we're going to put together a special presentation with all the amazing pictures we brought you. Because of the demand, we've decided that we will. We're going to show it twice, so we'd like to invite you to set your VCR for our one-hour commercial-free special on A Storm to Remember. We'll show it from 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning this Saturday, January 4th, and then from 4 till 5 o'clock in the morning this Sunday, January 5th. So again, set your VCR. It's the storm special you ask us to put together. Well, we have just six hours and about 46 minutes left of the year, 1996. But 1997 has already arrived in other parts of the world. This is Sydney, Australia, where the arrival of 1997 was celebrated along Sydney Harbor with a fireworks show costing a million dollars. In Hong Kong, 1997 brings not just a new year, but a new way of life. The British colony becomes a part of communist China on July 1st. And in Rome, Pope John Paul II celebrated New Year's Eve Mass at the Vatican as he said goodbye to 1996 with a traditional service of prayer and song. He focused on the new millennium. The Pope called on the faithful to get ready spiritually and culturally for the year 2000. When the new year arrives here, you'll see the biggest celebration of all right here. Fireworks like these from the Space Needle live here on Como TV 4. We'll look ahead to the big show just after 545. First, the story is bound to make you think twice about going overboard tonight. These signs are part of it, but kind of... The rain and warmer temperatures have improved conditions on our roads, and finally... Vancouver is no longer cut off from the interior. For the first time since the weekend blizzard, traffic is moving along Highway 1 between Abbotsford and Chilliwack. These pictures were taken shortly after the highway was reopened today. The route is extremely slippery, though, and drivers are urged to use caution. The Trans-Canada is not completely open, though. There are still road closures in effect from Chilliwack to Hope and from Hope to Lytton. And east of Golden, Highway 1 is closed due to the avalanche hazard. Also, the Hope-Princeton Highway is still closed between Hope and Princeton. The Fraser Valley had the worst of the snow and now is preparing for the worst of the flooding. Gabrielle Vito is live in Abbotsford tonight. Gabrielle, what's the latest? Well, it is raining very heavily in the Fraser Valley tonight, Mike. There is a heavy rainfall warning in effect for the greater Vancouver area tonight and a freezing rainfall warning for the folks out here in Abbotsford and Chilliwack. Now, tonight in Chilliwack, a, an emergency flood center is being set up, but we're being told by provincial emergency people that so far no flooding has been reported. But with the warmer temperatures and all the rain, residents out here are now dealing with heavy, wet snow. And that is causing roof cave-ins. The situation today at a local dairy farm created a disaster. A piece of plywood had to make do as a stretcher for the injured dairy cows. 
About two dozen of them were trapped when part of this barn roof collapsed. About 20 volunteer firefighters have been working since the early morning hours. Most of the animals have survived, thanks as well to members of the SBCA and three veterinarians who've also been on the scene. But some of the cows just couldn't stand the tons of rubble on top of them, while others were so injured no amount of work could save them and they had to be destroyed. What kind of injuries are these animals sustaining from this? Broken legs, broken backs, broken necks. How many have you had to destroy? I think we've destroyed five, give or take. About five, and about another five have died of natural, well, of their own. These two buildings used to be connected by a lower level roof. What firefighters think happened is that snow from the top roof slid down. The weight got too much and the roof collapsed. <laughs> Friends and neighbors pitched in, helping to get the rest of the snow off the roof and many lent equipment as well, but the work takes time. How difficult a rescue is this for members? Well, it's fairly difficult, needless to say, the working conditions are not that great, and then they have to move it basically sheet by sheet. So it's a very tedious and long process. There are about 200 cows total on this farm. The owner, Peter Friesen, was too upset to talk to us on camera, but he did tell us that some of the dead animals were carrying calves, and he's lost some of his best breeding stock. To try and avoid further loss and damage, the fire department is recommending if you have a large amount of snow on your roof, shovel or sweep it off. A real tragedy, Gabrielle, but that uh, dairy farm isn't the only structure affected, is it? No, definitely not, Mike. We've been uh, told of garages here in the valley that have collapsed, and the flower industry has been particularly hard hit. Greenhouses here in the valley and on the south end of Vancouver Island are suffering heavy, heavy damage again because of the snow. Now that means a big loss for growers and on a consumer note, it also probably means that we'll all be paying more for flowers in the new year. All right, Gabrielle, thanks. Stay dry. Gabrielle Vito reporting live tonight from Abbotsford. Meantime, a cleanup effort is also underway in the Victoria area tonight as roof after roof there caved in from the heavy snow. One man suffered a concussion and a plane was damaged when an airport roof gave way last night. The problem started in Esquimalt yesterday when the heavy snowfall collapsed the roof of Slegg's Lumber Warehouse. The weight of the snow also forced the walls down, destroying most of the building. The snow also brought garages down at a nearby trailer park. Roofs there buckled under the weight, and although no one was injured, the damage was extensive. Now for the latest information on the weather, we go live to Mark, who is out in this heavy rainfall. Mark, dare we ask, what's in store for us weather-wise? Well, more of this is that uh, the rain here in Vancouver is not as heavy as out in the valley. However, it looks like a messy New Year's Eve and a messy New Year's Day. We do have a heavy rain warning in effect for Greater Vancouver, a wind warning for Victoria, plus... Heavy and freezing rain, freezing rain warnings for the valley. Also freezing rain warning for Howe Sound and Whistler as well. Right now at Vancouver International, light rain showers, 5 degrees. Wind is from the east and the barometer is falling. Well, while it's slushy down here, it is nice up there. Today's rain didn't quite make it up to Cypress Mountain. And skiers couldn't have asked for a better day. The hill was packed with snow lovers oblivious to the rain and the slush down here at the lower elevations. Okay, now here's the situation we have. We have a whole series of systems moving in off the Pacific from the southwest. That is bringing up a lot of warmer air. We're going to see the temperatures climb up a bit. It also means a lot of rain. And when it runs into that cooler air that is still out in the valley and up through House Sound, that is going to change to freezing rain. And that's a real possibility, too. So here are the forecasts. First for Greater Vancouver, heavy rain warning is in effect. Lots of rain and strong winds tonight and tomorrow, too. Anywhere from 30 to 50 millimeters of rain will accumulate by tomorrow. It's going to be very mild, too. Highs tomorrow reaching 10. You remember it was minus 5 at this time last week? Heavy rain and freezing rain warnings for the valley tonight. The freezing rain will hit the eastern sections especially. And by tomorrow, anywhere from 40 to 60 millimeters will accumulate. High there near 7. And for southern Vancouver Island, a wind warning is out for greater Victoria. Heavy rain is expected there as well. Some strong south winds too. Gusts up to 70 kilometers per hour expected. And highs will be near 11. Now for the next three days after that, the rain will continue for Thursday. Showers or wet flurries possible for Friday as the cooler air comes back. Saturday will be cloudy with a chance of shower or flurries. And as I said, too, that freezing rain warning is also in effect for Whistler and Howe Sound. Please take it easy on the roads because just because it's clear of snow doesn't mean it's slippery. Rain can cause slick roads, too. And later, we'll look back at this wild weather year of 1996. and going out with a bang, I think, tonight. Yeah, I'll say it was wild. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Get back to you.
Despite the death of a motorist in Sydney, rescue and emergency crews are happy with the response to the storm. But if this happens next winter, we may not be so lucky. By then, much of the military equipment and personnel will have been transferred out of B.C. And now our politicians say Ottawa's cutbacks are endangering safety. Kate Corcoran reports. With the Fraser Valley and Lower Mainland are in serious jeopardy in the future if and when a natural disaster occurs because of... George Peel is furious with Ottawa, angry with a lack of military presence in B.C., especially in greater Vancouver municipalities, where most of B.C.'s population resides. They need the heavy equipment, uh, they need the coordination, the communication, and they need the manpower. Uh, and somebody has to look after it. I'm absolutely stunned, for example, that uh, the military doesn't have a heavy presence here on the West Coast. In fact, the only coordinated military presence able to assist in the Fraser Valley this weekend just happened to be reservists from across the country, training in Chilliwack with equipment soon to be shipped away. Well, yes, it was, it was uh, very fortuitous. So, what if this uh, weekend course hadn't been underway? Well, it would have been, uh, would have been a different, uh, different story, uh, certainly. Um, it's, uh, it would have been hard, uh, hard to get, uh, to get soldiers into, into Chilliwack. And that is the issue, because when CFB Chilliwack closed down in July, the result of government cutbacks, Ottawa promised that regular troops in Edmonton would respond within hours to any BC emergency. But those troops with heavy snow equipment were unable to respond when called on by the Attorney General. Is this an embarrassment for the military that Edmonton really just couldn't do anything? Well, I think it's a reflection of, of the reality of, of the, the, the situation that we've got in terms of uh, resources. I'm sure that the, the, the Department of Defense, or the, uh, the minister in charge in Ottawa has already said, I would assume he's already said, well, this just happened as once in a lifetime occurrence, it won't happen again. And how did the Minister of Defense respond to BC's concerns? Uh, I don't think that we could possibly begin to uh, uh, evaluate the need for military establishments in this country based on weather occurrences every 75 years. Well, that comment of Mr. Young's really um, uh, betrays a very deep lack of concern and understanding of our situation in British Columbia, particularly over the last two or three days. Um, you know, snowstorms, earthquakes uh, aren't on any schedule. It's unlikely the weekend disaster will reopen a base in B.C., but it could mean that the attention will bring more military equipment here to help train reservists and to protect residents in case of a future disaster. In other news tonight, murder charges are pending against a 27-year-old man after two women were shot to death in an East Vancouver home. The shooting took place at this house in the 100 block of East 64th Avenue early today. Several people were in the home when the suspect walked in and fired at two women in their 20s. The suspected gunman later surrendered to police. He was taken into custody. We're holding him and uh, we'll probably be talking to him later on today. We have seized a handgun and a car the man was driving. And we expect to lay charges of murder uh, sometime this afternoon. Police are calling it a domestic situation. They say at least one of the victims knew the suspect. No motive has been determined. Police say they are having some problems communicating because of a language barrier. And we have more coverage coming up on the cleanup after this latest snowstorm. The end is in sight for weary work crews. We'll have that story coming up later. Canada played the Czech Republic today over at the World Junior Hockey Championships. It was our country's final game of the opening round. We'll have the highlights and a whole lot more. Sports is coming up in about half an hour. And residents in the Seattle area are also picking up the pieces. That story next. You're watching Team Coverage on U News at 6 with Russ Rose and Suzette Myers. On your mark. Multiple car pileup involving at least 13 or 14 cars. We understand that there were no serious injuries, remarkable as it seems from these pictures. Uh, however, there were treacherous, treacherous, and they are advising anyone who does not have to drive tonight to not drive. 
Um, a couple of other updates on highways, Tony. Uh, 91, uh, 91A East-West Connector, there's another 11-car motor vehicle accident. At the Cape Horn Interchange, another 11-car motor vehicle accident. And, of course, things are still especially bad between Chilliwack and Abbotsford, um, particularly in the Lickman Road and Yale areas. The eastbound lanes of Highway 1 are now closed because of slippery roads and icy conditions. So once again, police are saying stay off the roads uh, if you can. If you don't have to drive, don't. If you are on the roads and you have to drive, take it easy. Catherine, thanks very much. Now, let's get to uh, News Hour Life. A consumer warning leads our agenda tonight. Paula? Right, that's right, Tony. Thanks. She just leave them out there rather than force taxpayers to pay for any new rescue effort. Scores of people opted to stay out fishing on Lake Simcoe near Barrie, Ontario, even though hundreds of others chose to be airlifted to safety last weekend. A 32-kilometer long pressure crack split the ice around the southern end of the lake. The rescue operation is thought to have cost upwards of half a million dollars. Timmins, Ontario should get a dusting from the snowstorm moving through the province, but even the expected five centimeters is a danger in a city that's received some 200 centimeters of snow since early December. Roofs are straining under the load, and at least one ski hill operator says there's more snow than his equipment can handle. They brought snow into Miramichi, New Brunswick over the weekend. Unusually mild weather frustrated organizers of the annual Maritime Snowmobile Festival. Michelle Skierman reports. When snowmobilers come to town, the city of Miramichi certainly makes them feel welcome. In preparation for the festival, the city didn't clear snow. Instead, they brought it downtown on purpose. There isn't a motel on the north side of the city that you can't get to with a snowmobile, including the Civic Center where we are now. The city has laid down snow. We've had our big groomer right downtown to the motel. So uh, you know, the city's been just extremely cooperative. You couldn't get a hotel room anywhere in the vicinity of Miramichi this past weekend. Close to 1,500 snowmobilers converged on the city, coming from as far away as Quebec and Maine. Weather conditions on Saturday were less than ideal. Rain and mild temperatures threatened the trails and caused equipment problems for this snowmobiler. They're a two-stroke machine, and they, they definitely like the cold weather, and they react a lot better you know, with a mixed fuel. And that. But when it's warm, they don't tend to, to operate as efficiently. But we're out here, and we're having fun anyway. That's what it's all about. Snowmobilers were offered guided tours on the province's 9,000-kilometer trail system. And when the weather turned really bad, most people headed inside for the social events, which included an antique snowmobile show. Michelle Skierman, Earthwatch News, Miramichi, New Brunswick. Travelers next. This Travelers forecast is brought to you by CarStar. CarStar. Tomorrow, without any answer. CarStar, where Canada goes for quality collision repair. CarStar, where Canada goes for quality collision repair.
Well, Mark's back with forecast now. And Mark, I wonder what those really high freezing levels mean for uh, skiing. Well, yeah, not great skiing right now. I think uh, Whistler Blackcomb might have picked up a, a fair bit of snow right at the very top. Of mm -hmm. course, the mountains go up a long way there, but North Shore Mountains and through the southern interior, it's been rain on the mountains, so not great. Yeah. Uh, you know, in our, our ski forecast, uh, we should have indicated dropping freezing levels for tomorrow, so there is oh. some good news. Yeah, okay. yeah, they're way sky high today, but uh, dropping substantially by tomorrow, especially the south coast, yeah, even the southern interior, so uh, there is some good news on the horizon. Deborah, what hasn't been stressed yet, and I just want to mention this, is uh, actually Environment Canada very accurately predicted this heavy rainfall event, so... Uh, just that had to out. get that in, Had to Mark? get that in, yeah, we've taken a bit of uh, heat <laughs> lately, but uh, it's it was just right the on the snow line. you have a little trouble with. Snow's a bit tough this year. There's always next year, and uh, <laughs> we're going to work on that, but uh, it was well done uh, by Environment Canada. Now, there's still more rain to come. I have three pages of statistics. I hope uh, it's not an overload, but very, very interesting material here, uh, I think. Uh, rainfall amounts, look at those numbers. Uh, we've gone over these in the last 24 hours, but I have a little more to add. So those are the latest figures. Phenomenal, really. 100 millimeters almost at Vancouver Airport. Page two goes into, uh, well, Vancouver Airport, 200 millimeters so far uh, this month, breaking the old record from 1974, and it's only March 19th. We have more rain to come, uh, at least some, uh, through the rest of the month. And it's only the second time uh, in history, in 63 years of records at Vancouver Airport, we've had over 40 millimeters in one 24-hour period. Okay, on to page three. Well, uh, look at that. 18 inches of rain in 24 hours at Henderson Lake on the southwest part of Vancouver Island. Now, that's in 24 hours, as I say, shattering all records except for one day, I believe, uh, for British Columbia, which was a uh, long, long time ago. So, boy, this is one of the heaviest rain events in history, never mind March and a very mild, of course, across the province. So let's look at the airport quickly and show you that, yeah, it's mild. 11 degrees, still some rain falling. In our 